And I, I would take exception only to one part of your statement. I wouldn't say that these crafts are going to fail in 20 years. What we know is they are being licensed for 20 years. I mean, we, structures can last much longer. Um, the NRC's current claim is that they will last for 100 years. I'm, I haven't evaluated independently, and you know, I'm not a concrete expert. So, uh, uh, the independent part of it is very important. I think the NRC. We have a sort of a better regulatory system than Japan, and Japan had a better regulatory system than the Soviet Union. Um, but you know, there was a terrible accident in the Soviet Union. There'd been a terrible accident in Japan. So having a better regulatory system may be damning by faint praise, you know? So um, it doesn't guarantee that it won't happen here. I, I do think that since the mid-90s, the NRC has been quite reluctant to impose costs we're still doing too much cost-benefit stuff. Um, dense pack pools are cost-benefit, even though the National Academy said in 2003 that um, you know dry casts are safer than spent fuel pool. But the National Academies was not allowed to make a recommendation on that finding by the terms of its the reference of its study. It was not allowed to say, therefore, we think you should move it out and store. It was not. And the NRC said, cost benefit, we think it's just as good and it's OK. I, I think given that we are in the waste confidence kind of situation that we are in now, which we weren't in 2003, because they said we'll have a repository by when? 2025, I think, was the date then. That's definitely not going to happen. So I think all of these things need to be re-examined in light of the failure of the repository program of the United States, which was a dismal mess. And unfortunately, and I say that as a supporter of a repository program. I've tried to be constructive for 30 years. Uh, I'm still trying to be constructive. But the, 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 we, we need to find a way to make independent voices that have demonstrable technical merit stick. But we don't know how. Uh, how is the NRC planning to uh, inspect and tell us what's going on inside of these high burn up uh, fuel uh, dry casts? Well, you can, you can measure the radiation if there's, you know, there's a too late basis for being able to say. Um, I think on the vertical casts, it may be a little easier than on these concrete things. Marvin, can you answer that? I agree. I, I think. I think um, I know in the castor casks, they have uh, helium pressure sensors. I don't know if these ones do. Do they have? Can we tell if the helium is they, leaking? They have radiation detectors uh, on the cast themselves. Yeah, uh, but on the outside. Is leaking out. On the outside, but then it's yeah. too late. On the outside. Do, the, do these have helium leak pressure sensors? Do these casts have helium pressure sensors? No, they just measure it before they put the second lid on. Well, yeah, so obviously all is good when you put it in, yeah. but then what? So this is why I'm saying we need a comparison oh, of these casks. Uh, why? This is why I said earlier is I looked into the caster casks some. I haven't, you know, I worried about nuclear weapons for 25 years. So in the last five, eight years, I'm thinking, OK, I've worried about nuclear weapons so much. We've shut down most of the nuclear weapons plants. At least we've accomplished that. So I worry more about energy. And um, so I haven't actually looked at all corners of this problem. Uh, and uh, this is this. So I don't. I'm not as familiar with the details of all these casks. Mm -hmm. But I think I think you really should challenge the NRC and Southern California Edison. They're spending your money. Yes. So. Um, why not? Why not have the best possible casks? So, so it is appropriate to say, though, if there's any checking going on, it's after the fact. So we can't tell yeah, if something I, gets so broken or something happens on the inside. I, I, I would take Marvin's word in this matter because he has looked at these issues a lot more carefully and longer than I have. Hi, uh, come on up. <laughs> Marvin. You need to come up. back up, Marvin. Come on up. We're going to have a panel. <laughs> yeah. Do okay. Good. All right. Okay. Uh, I live uh, just a few miles from San Onofre, um, 
And I, after studying the high burn up issue um, and other things about nuclear waste, I realized that the best we can hope for is to figure out what we can get Edison to do or somebody to do to make us as safe as possible. Not safe, but safer. But I don't know enough to be able to say what that is. And I realize there's limits to the technology. So for example, with the spent fuel pools, um, forgetting about what it cost, what are, I would like to know what are the things that could be done if you have the money to make us safer for that 20 plus years that's gonna be sitting there with Edison's mismanagement. So that's one, one question that I would like to have answered. And I, I, I don't have hope that they've got a dry cast solution today for high burn up, but it, it seems to me that they're not really working hard enough in prioritizing that issue. Or maybe there's some experts that know what they should be doing different. Um, so you know, so you see what I'm looking for. I'm trying to look for that best thing, so we so we can start demanding those kind of recommendations and lobbying like we did to get the plant shut down. But we need the ammunition of the facts so that we can uh, put forth you know the best uh, uh, the best demands. You know, the, the, and then fight like hell for it. Rather than a technical answer, my first answer to your question would be to ask: Is there a community oversight board for this process? An no. official one. Okay. Not, not, not a. Okay. Not yet. So, not an independent I, so you've thought of this already. Right. I think that should be your um, priority there one. We're going to talk about and, that on the panel. Okay. So, mm, but not as an obstructionist thing, because I think you've shut the reactors down. Uh, it, in terms of risk of meltdown and so on, you know, but we have this residual problem that's still very big but it's a mutual problem to solve. So my analogy would be having worked on nuclear weapons problems from 1980 to 82. I'm still working on them, but not as much as before. Um, is if you shut down a nuclear weapons, we can argue about whether you like nuclear weapons or not, and I don't, so I want to stop that. So it's like a nuclear power plant, I don't like them, so I want to see an end to it. But once you've done that, or even before, there's the nuclear waste on this side. And where I have not agreed with our community is they say, it's their problem. I'm saying it's not their problem. It's our problem mostly, because they're not going to do it well without us. So I think we've arrived at the stage in this community where a cooperative, vigilant process that isn't looking to the bottom line of some reacting to share price on Wall Street. They've got enough money over there. Mm -hmm. the, the, and so I like the spirit that I'm hearing is, so what is the best that we can do before we ask what is it going to cost? Obviously, that matters, you know, right. because there are economic justice and social justice questions. You don't want to s stick somebody that's got, you know, that's living on $800 of social security with it with an increase in the electric bill. But we can find solutions to those problems. Um, the, the, the technical part of your question is I agree with you that we do not, this high burn up thing has slipped all of our attention and it became a fact. And I know for a fact that they have not looked at it. In fact, the NRC's own research plan was not for high Cast and what we're going to do storage and disposal. It was simply how we're going to find out what is going on. <laughs> they don't even, they're not even implementing that plan for monitoring degradation. The charts that I showed you are all based on reactor measurements of fuel on discharge from reactors as to what happened to them when we did this. They're not post storage examinations. Mm -hmm. right. We have none. So we need to ask for post-storage examinations. We've got some high burn up fuel that is stored here and many other sites. We need even to settle what is the maximum burn up that actually happened? Because somebody said, you know, somebody worked there said 60,000. And I'm inclined to say, well, you know, they must know what they're talking about. But then, you know, we've got a Department of Energy uh, official publication that said 67,000, which I think well, you know, so is there any kind of documentation out there that, okay, let's take the dry cast, for example. Um, what's the, the, 
is there documentation or, or somebody that, 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 that if, if you were going to have a dry cast system in your backyard, which one would it be, you know, and, or what the criteria yeah. would be? Right, that's the better question, is you want the criteria for, if you're going to put it in dry cast, so mm -hmm. leaving aside that high burn up right. rescue thing, we're going to have dry cast for most of this stuff, and that's a good thing. Then you have two questions. The first question is, how do we harden this storage so that the maximum damage of the worst case accident is not catastrophic for vast areas? Mm -hmm. That's the, and there are a set of criteria corresponding to that. I have my ideas of how that should be done. Somebody else has an idea. Then you're talking comparing designs, uh -huh. and, and you should compare designs and approaches and concepts. So is there any documentation already on there this? There is some I mean, science and global security uh, published that paper in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, the Alvarez et al. paper is a good one. There's a National Academy of Sciences paper. I don't think it goes into comparisons between dry casts. But um, the Germans have done, again, a reasonably good job of thinking this through. So they've got better uh, casts than we do then? It, a not fully researched answer okay. would be probably. Okay. And then the spent fuels, um, you know, it, it, there were like a list of things. I don't care if they have to build another one that works better, but just. I mean, we're risking the world economy if this thing blows. I mean, this is not a minor thing here. Uh, if you have a worst case event here, it will be very, very bad for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So, but I don't feel like there's the, the priority there to, you know, I know the NRC is not going to do it. Okay. They don't have the so, power, even if they wanted so now, to. So now I'll answer the question of why isn't the government more thinking like you and me, that if this happened, the consequences are intolerable, so we should do everything to prevent it. So we have this thing called risk analysis. Risk analysis is sensible from a certain point of view and totally nonsensical for what we're talking about. Because what it does is it says, we have these consequences and we could lose a good part of the agriculture of the United States and uh, you know, a good part of the coastline, you know, all that. 40% of the cargo so, or the French have estimated the damages from a worst case accident at 500 billion or some, you know, astronomical sum of money. And then, and then that, that's plus you've got all the cancers and on, on, on and on. Now, then you multiply it by the probability. And somehow, magically, all the probabilities of catastrophic events are automatically low. Mm -hmm. We actually don't know how to calculate the probabilities of these things, Richard. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, I'm not concerned with so that. I'm just trying to find out the data. Mul but that's why the government is in engaged, because they say, oh, it's a one in 10 million yeah. probability okay. multiplied by jillions and jillions, and so the annual average, so the annual amount at risk is $500, or whatever. And then $500 is a trivial amount, yeah. you know, it's not cost beneficial to spend $1,000 to fix it. But it's like going to the hospital and them telling you, you know, very little of this blood is likely to be contaminated with HIV. You need a transfusion, you know, be really, really costly to screen everything just to catch those few. So why don't you just, and you know, that would not, it's not sensible, but that's how we're thinking. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm just trying to know the right answer so I at least have that base to start from, because right now I don't, I don't know enough about what, what's the best thing could possibly do. Well, I, I've tried to in, indicate the right answer is that you need to do comparison of the casks in the context of a hardened, hardened storage system concepts, and then you select the concept you want to implement or can implement given everything that has already happened, including for pool protection. There are, there are concepts for pool protection also, not published by me. They have taken fuel out of the pool at Songs too and put it into dry casts. You don't have to wait for 20 years. There's fuel in the pool now that can be removed. The more fuel you take out of the pool now, the better it is. Uh, you know, the fuel that has to sit for 20 years, so, well, that's a whole other story, but you greatly reduce the risk by taking some fuel out of the pool as quickly as you can. Right, I mean, that's why I said, you know, while you're looking at these things, it's important not to stop this process because the big risk reduction is happening by thinning the pools out and putting in dry storage. I, th I think it's mainly all high burn up that's left in there, so.
Oh, I see. I'm Glenn Pascal from the Sierra Club. We deserve a round of applause for our mutual commitment to getting this right and moving ahead fearlessly. Thank you. And by the way, I do want to honor Donna Gilmore, who virtually single-handedly brought this whole high burn issue to the forefront and is, is now educating the experts as well as learning from them. Thank you so much. A real contribution. Um, we're going to focus now on how do we effectively apply everything we've learned. And when I came today, I had a bunch of questions that I've had all the way through, and by gosh, our presenters have addressed them as directly as possible, aided by your great questions. What's the reality on the ground at San Onofre? What are the choices and possibilities? What are the best practices? How might these be affected by future technology? What are the realities behind the remote storage issue? How can we take all the above and use it to make a difference in the outcome here? And what are the relative roles of working through the regulators or creating a citizen groundswell to bring about a better outcome at San Onofre. And I think the undercurrent here is we've seen what's happened. Twelve nuclear plants have been retired in the last ten years. Those of us who went to hear the NRC explain this, it took me a while to figure out that these so-called unconditionally released sites are what I call nuclear forest lawns. Green on the outside, red on the inside. You've got places that are no longer operating nuclear plants, but they are fortresses of entombed nuclear waste. Is that the fate here on this extremely constricted site, or can we hope for something better? I want to compliment Ace Hoffman, who brings the same level of expertise as our presenters earlier. He would wave that off, but it's true. Uh, and Carol is a voice of balance and wisdom in this whole effort. Ray Lutz and Martha Sullivan have done something extraordinary. They have gotten themselves recognized as legal interveners with the California Public Utilities Commission at these hearings where billions of dollars are at stake in terms of the wise use of money that's already been collected and continuing surcharges imposed on us as ratepayers. So what I'd like to do is throw it open to this group to talk about how we bring about an outcome at San Onofre that's different from what's just happened at a dozen plants. And Carol, it looks like you have a framing issue you'd like to toss in at the front end. Um, wanted to have the, both of the speakers. Oh, absolutely. We welcome them, them back to the podium. Um, so. Yeah, we wanted to bring uh, the two uh, guests back up. Right. And also, the, the issue of effectiveness and a different outcome really has been nicely addressed in the responses to several key questions. We're not starting from ground zero here, but let's see if we can fill in the other elements of that. What is the reality and how do we have a changed and better outcome in this situation? Ray Lutz, the CEO of Citizens Oversight, and by the way, Ray, thank you for serving as our treasurer as we put this event together. Ray, thank you. Is this on? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an update um, about the CPUC meetings that are going on. Actually, we're flying out tomorrow morning. Uh, it's going to be all week. And this session next week is called the, tr it's called the Nuclear uh, Cost Triennial Proceeding. Nu uh, nuclear Decommissioning, nu Triennial, nuclear decommissioning Triennial Cost Proceeding. Um, they do these once every three years. They look at what is the cost uh, going to be for decommissioning these plants? And do we have enough money in the fund? Is it funded enough? And then uh, what are we going to invest the money in, in the fund? And then the third one is how are we going to spend the money like when it actually gets spent? And they haven't done much on that, of course, yet because uh, um, they haven't had the opportunity to, spend, to do the decommissioning. And this proceeding that we're in right now actually started before they announced that they were going to shut it down. So uh, it's sort of a surprise and they're, they're having trouble shifting gears. And so we came in a bit late in this, in this proceeding, but next week we're, we're, we are proposing to set up a citizen's oversight panel, we're calling it a COP, just because it's sort of cute. And 
it will be uh, uh, modeled after the same type of boards that they use for high school districts and hospital districts watching the bonds being spent for um, you know building um, new high schools and hospital facilities and those have worked pretty well in fact they're required now if you want to get you know lower vote uh, for those things and so this is the idea is to have this um, proposed there and kind of reacting to that poorly at this point and I don't know if we're going to be able to get that through as an official um, advisory body of the CPUC but that's what we're proposing that they actually help uh, you know pay for costs and so forth for it uh, and if not then we will continue to set up our own uh, oversight panel anyway because there's nothing stopping us from doing this even if it's not an official an official body, but it'd be better if it was because then it'd be easier to get money from them for for costs. And so I just wanted to, I did want to answer one, a couple of questions that it seems like we understand that uh, Southern California Edison intends to rapidly dismantle the plant um, within just a few years. This is what it looks like uh, as I look at their plans, although they haven't submitted any formal plans yet. This is what it sounds like they're planning. They want to get the money out of the decommissioning fund as quickly as possible. And they want it to process that to their pockets. And they're going to be their own subcontractor, another problem. Uh, they've got $4 billion in the fund that they uh, about. And you can imagine the professional wolves that circle around that kind of money. And um, watching it and watching them spend it correctly is what, what we really need to focus on. And that's why, you know, our proposal. But that, that's what I understand. And, and things such as the dome, they're required to, to grind it down the first half an inch off the concrete, process that as, as a different type of waste, and then demolish the rest of the concrete. So there's different steps that they go through. Uh, I think they're going to try to do it quickly. And, and they've been th throwing around this term called a nuclear, I um, sorry, a fuel pool island where they're gonna to try to keep just the fuel pool itself and supporting infrastructure for that and demolish everything else quickly and then just be left with the fuel pool. And of course the ISFACI, which is uh, the, um, the name that they use, ISSFI. They call it an IS if ISFACI. <laughs> the dry cast area. area. So that's my update and uh, again, we're, we appreciate your contributions to this effort monetarily because right now we're doing it on our own and we don't have yet any compensation coming back from the CPUC and the outlook is not that great because of the fact they don't like us that much yet. But <laughs> As Ray has noted, there are two completely different prongs to this, the NRC safety front, the Public Utilities Commission economic front. We're trying to cover both of them. And Ray pointed out very importantly, we already have de facto constituted ourselves as a citizen's watchdog group. And I want to acknowledge what Gene Stone has done. Gene is the quiet but persistent coordinator for this de facto citizen oversight group that already exists. Thank you, Gene. Update from the NRC. They're going to have an answer to our official recognition within two weeks, they said. It's pretty terrific. Gene has developed such a good working relationship with the NRC that we actually had priority status in asking questions when they were in Carlsbad on um, September 26th. And Gene's first question was, how soon are you gonna recognize our citizen oversight committee? So uh, we're pushing the edge on that. I'm sort of the uh, cleanup hitter for the uh, committee, uh, Coalition to Decommission San Onofre. And both um, Ray and Gene and Glenn have brought up some of the points that I was gonna talk about. But I think this is, is very important just to kind of highlight what this coalition is doing. Um, and there's a lot of, we've acknowledged a lot of people, but we have to also acknowledge Gary and Lori Hedrick, who ha have been running San Onofre Safety. And we really appreciate all that they've put into this San work. San, excuse me, San Clemente Green, Don is San Clemente uh, Safety, San Onofre Safety. Sorry, it's hot, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, uh, I just wanted to also acknowledge the Sierra Club um, because they have come, come into this. Thank you. 
a very active participant, the Angeles chapter, which covers both Los Angeles County and Orange County. And we're also now, um, we have a request and the Sierra Club Santa Margarita group is coming into this and they sent a very generous donation of $1,000 to help fund our work. And the Sierra Club, um, Glenn and others have been raising money um, for this symposium as well as Jean. So I think that, you know, these are the, some of the people that have been moving it. But what we want to talk about is getting all of you involved in helping us move it even farther. And, um, you know, I, as I was listening today, I was thinking like, you know, you could walk out of here and go, oh my God, we're doomed. But, you know, the reality is we are in the process of helping find solutions to questions you know, I think the speakers are basically saying there are a lot of things that have been set in motion without having the answers. And we need to demand those answers. You know, if there's anything we should walk out of here today, it's that we really need citizen oversight. We need to have official recognition by the NRC for a citizen's oversight committee for decommissioning. We need to have that recognition from the PUC so that we have that kind of recognition there, that these agencies, the agencies, the regulatory agencies, the industry, they need us watching every step of the way and raising questions about what they are doing. And that's where, that's where a lot of us can do the heavy lifting and figure out aspects of that. But we want you to become engaged too, because as I said, you know, we're not alone in this. It's not just Sandy, or not just, you know, San Onofre that's the problem. It's all of the nuclear power plants in this country and in the world have to resolve these issues. So anything we do, anything that happens at one of the other plants, you know, this is really important for all of us. The fact that San Onofre shut down went around the world and was an inspiration to this renaissance of the anti-nuclear movement. And we need to be aware of that, that what we do here goes beyond just the, our 50 mile radius, our 100 mile radius, beyond Southern California, that we all become inspirations for each other and we need to be cross-sharing that information. I, I, when I think about Fukushima, I think about you know looking at what kinds of practices are we using here in the United States? How can we get an international body to intervene in that and put all of the knowledge that we have in the world into these problems? So these are the things that, that our coalition is going to be doing. Um, Arjun talked about an incent conform, uh, informed consent process. That's only going to happen through citizen participation. So I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you've signed up. But we really need you to help to, to do more, uh, to go out and spread the word. We'll continue doing these educational events. We'll continue having really good handouts and information for you up on Donna's website. And we will continue to let you know about these trigger incidents where we need to get out and come to the meetings. We, we're we're going to reschedule, we get a rescheduled nuclear confidence meeting. You know, stay in touch with us because we'll be letting you know about all of this. But we need you to get out there and we need you to spread the word to your neighbors and friends and get everyone involved in this because this is a problem. It's a community problem and it's one we can solve together. So thank you. Carol, thank you. And by the way, we, we are going to have another symposium fairly soon. We actually raised enough money for two of them, and there's a lot to talk about. So those of you who are here today, one way to, to re-up on your commitment is to attend our next symposium. But I do want to underscore what Ray Lutz said and Martha Sullivan at the back of the room. These folks are on the front line in San Francisco at the PUC. They're raising tough questions. We've only raised half of the $3,000 they need to stay in an even, even in a cheap hotel in San Francisco. Um, if you are concerned about those issues, please direct your check with a, a subject line that says necessary expenses. Martha's holding up the flyer about the PUC back. coverage back there. Now with regard to where are we right now, Gene Stone had this wonderful phrase, we are safer now that San Onofre is closed, but we are not yet safe. And as if confirmation was required last Wednesday, we had a siren test here. And we got in the mail a helpful flyer from Edison with San Onofre on the cover. That plant is shut. We're still having siren tests. After our discussion today about the fuel pool 
and about packing high burn fuel into dense storage maybe you can understand where we're still having siren tests here even though the plant is still closed and when gene had the concept of the symposium he said the immediate goal is to be sure best practices are applied here at san onofre to make the community as safe as possible the ultimate goal is to reinvigorate the national debate on nuclear waste management so whichever level applies or appeals to you we're working on both of them simultaneously and i, I just i, I want to call on ace but first i want to thank our two presenters for absolutely spectacular presentations that matched scientific credibility with political realism and a high level of communication thank you so much